Okay, guys. I hope that you can hear me okay. So um, this is a continuation of the lecture from class entitled War and Impact. And we're talking about, the quickly talking about the American Revolution um, in three phases and then looking at the war's end and impact. So the first few slides are just review. So I want to just remind you that at the beginning of this war, it was unlikely that the Continental Army and the Patriots could pull off a victory against Britain, right? Colonies had tried in the past, but never had a colony defeated the mother country in a war uh, for revolution. So the Patriot weaknesses compounded with British strengths, right? And history is on the side of the Brits here. Um, it's, it's slim to none chance that the colonies can overthrow Britain. We talked in class about the first two phases of the war. So I'm just going to kind of briefly recap, right? The New England phase, 75 to 77, Patriot armies don't have a single large victory, but they do inflict more damage on the British than would have been anticipated. The British evacuate Boston. They take their soldiers. They move them out to Nova Scotia. Um, and the Battle of Bunker Hill was detrimental to the British Army as well. Uh, as we move into the Mid-Atlantic region, we know that the war became conventional, which means that it was fought in the traditional open battlefield. This is bad for the Americans. They have an additional bad winter at Valley Forge, where their supplies are depleted, their men are kind of demoralized. But luckily, during that same time, the British, as a result of underestimating the colonists, make a series of blunders that result in their surrendering of a major fort in Saratoga, New York. This is a turning point of the war. Make sure you write that down. Um, because at this point, the French are now convinced that the colonies have a shot here. And so they openly throw their support behind the colonies and join the war, giving more than they had in the past, which is just verbal support and supplies. Now they're actually going to send over troops, military weapons, um, boats, and things like that. So the French join the war here, and this is really a turning point. The third phase of the war um, is fought in the southern colonies, so North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Um, and this is really categorized um, by repeated clashes between Loyalist and Patriot militias. The British were hoping that Loyalist support would win them the southern colonies, but unfortunately that wasn't the case, as the Continental Army was successful throughout the other colonies. More and more Loyalists either fled the southern colonies or threw their support behind the Patriots, so they kind of flip-flopped if they didn't flee. So the British didn't get the Loyalist support they needed to win the southern colonies. In addition to that, we no longer see the conventional warfare that we did in the Mid-Atlantic colonies. This is fought in communities using civilians. Civilians are very engaged. Women, children, slaves um, are fighting on behalf of the Patriots. And so the southern portion of the war does not go well for the British. So really that brings us to the final major skirmish of the war, 1781 in Yorktown, Virginia. So Yorktown was essentially the British headquarters. General Cornwallis, commander of the entire British army, um, had a large number of soldiers, weaponry, supplies stationed in Yorktown. The plan was for Washington and the Continental Army to trap Cornwallis in Yorktown, and by a very happy coincidence, the French happened to show up here in significant numbers as well, which allowed Washington to trap Cornwallis and his soldiers by land and by sea. And I'll show you what that looked like in a second. The result is that Great Britain surrendered seven to 8,000 men, including General Cornwallis. And this is a symbolic surrender as well as a literal surrender. So after this surrender of 8,000 men, there was no way that the British were gonna go on to win the war. So the war, violence-wise, is all but over. In addition to that, it's symbolic because people at home in Britain had really lost the will to fight. Taxpayers are sick of seeing their tax money go toward this war, and many people are starting to take on the perspective that, hey, the colonies, they want independence? Fine. We don't want them. Let them go. So the British population had really lost the morale needed to fight this war. Um, and so the war is all but over here. So here's an image 
of how the colonies um, and the French together were able to trap the British. So you can see in the center of the screen here, you have a large kind of accumulation of British soldiers and weapons. The American Continental Army comes up from the south, and you can see the navy blue rectangles here, and they are joined by French ground troops over to um, the right side, oh, sorry, the left side of your screen, as well as the French fleet, which was key in trapping the British here. There was no way the British could get away. Um, they had a huge fleet present in Yorktown, and so this really prevented any form of escape. Um, and formally ends the fighting portion of the war. However, no war is officially over unless there is a peace treaty that's negotiated. And the Treaty of Paris of 1783 is the peace treaty that officially ends the American Revolution. In addition to independence, Ben Franklin and some of his colleagues are able to negotiate a few other terms as well. So Ben Franklin takes the lead on this negotiation. He meets with other British officials and the American Confederation Congress, and they hammer out the details of British surrender. So first and foremost, North America is granted independence from Great Britain, colonies become states, and those colonies are united in a confederation. And or Sorry, those states are united in a confederation, which I'll talk about in a second. In addition to independence, the Americans gained all territory east of the Mississippi. This is the British land that was gained by uh, the proclamation of 1763 at the end of the war. In addition, um, this negotiation resulted in the end of a friendly U.S.-France relationship. Um, France was not consulted by the Confederation Congress and were kind of cut out of the peace treaty negotiations. And as you can imagine, with all that they put into the war, they were not super happy with that. So the US and the, Fr and the French did not have a great relationship moving forward, okay? And so here's a map that shows us kind of what um, the Treaty of Paris actually gives the United States, right? States now, not colonies anymore. Um, and so the area that I want you to look at is not the green because those are the 13 original colonies, now states, but is the pink and the yellow because these are areas that were obtained by the Treaty of Paris and immediately begin to be settled and admitted as either states or territories. Okay, so the United States is now independent and it's growing. So we'll talk about kind of the impact of that. So the last kind of thing I want to talk to you guys about is the impact of this victory. So as I mentioned earlier, now that we have independence, um, the Confederation has to decide what they're going to do with it. So these states now have to come together to form a new government that can function in the place of British Parliament. So that's task one, and we're going to talk about that in class tomorrow. Secondly, the war, while obviously a victory for patriots and the Continental Army, um, was a major loss for Loyalists. Loyalists, over 80,000 of them, fled either to Canada or to Great Britain after the war was over. And of these 80,000, the majority of them were upper-class citizens, gentry, aristocrats. Um, and so they got out of there, and that really kind of changes the makeup of the colonies significantly, actually. And additionally, um, American Indians do not make out well, as the uh, 13 states now absorbed the territory that the British won in the French and Indian War. They immediately start settling that territory and pushing American Indians out of that territory. So there's continued conflicts between the two groups, and the British really don't go to bat for American Indians that helped them in the war. They kind of um, ignore them and their well-being in the negotiations of the Treaty of Paris. So this is just the beginning of a long history of conflict between the American Indians and American settlers. Some slaves who served in the Continental Army received manumission. These are slaves in the North. Manumission is essentially the um, choice of a master to free his slaves. And so here is the kind of beginning of the end of slavery in the North. 
Slaves in the South who fought for the Continental Army and slaves who fought for the British were not granted manumission, so remained in a state of slavery. And then finally, if we look at women, um, women really didn't have many rights in the early republic. Uh, as we know, the Declaration of Independence is all men are created equal, and there is no mention whatsoever of women. But the revolution gives birth to this new kind of persona that a woman is supposed to fulfill, and that's the persona of the republican motherhood. And this idea kind of tethers women to, this, to the raising of future citizens. So in the home, the mother gives birth to and then cultivates in her children democratic citizens that will grow up to take, you know, to, to participate in American government. And so this is kind of a symbolic, as I mentioned, role for women, when in reality, they're largely left out of any political rights that are given to colonists after the war. And we're going to talk a little bit more about women tomorrow. Okay. Um, so here, I'm going to leave you with this picture here of George Washington and his men crossing the Delaware River. This is obviously a glorification of Washington, but is significant when we start to think about the um, creation of a new government and obviously a leader for that new government. Because this victory in the American Revolution really created in Washington this mythic figure of freedom, independence, bravery. Um, and so we'll come back to Washington when we start to think about the Constitution. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what our new government is going to look like uh, tomorrow in class. Okay, be sure to write down any questions that you have guys from the rest of this lecture. Um, and I've left a question on Schoology for you to answer. So in addition to taking these notes, uh, you'll want to work to answer this question. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye guys. Okay.